Okay, I think we're ready. Sorry for the delay. In English, that means shut up. Okay, sorry about that. We were uh, waiting for the DL guy to start the recording. He said there's Murphy's Law, but it really ought to be called Valco's Law. So. Is everybody having a good day? <laughs> Sorry? So I was coming back yesterday from uh, Berkeley to Los Angeles, or from Oakland to Los Angeles, and we were kind of the last ones on the plane, it's a long story, but uh, there were actually people who came in behind us, and there was a gentleman who, uh, and the way Southwest plane fills up is, you know, everybody sits up front, and then they sort of work their way back, and we were near the back end, and this gentleman comes in, and he's kind of a take command kind of guy, you know, beard and wavy hair and, you know, Mother Earth clothes and big old bags and everything else. And I, I'll, be, uh, I'll be with you in a second. I'll sit down in a second, you know, talking to the stewardess or the flight attendant. And so uh, he gets his stuff put in, and he puts it down, and then uh, this enormous, and I don't mean in good shape, but very large black man comes in and, he sits down in the row of seats with him, and I'm not trying to listen, but it was impossible not to. And so he says, uh, so what's you do? And he says, uh, <laughs> he says, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, and uh, I make films. And he says, really? What you made that I might see? And he says, uh, well, do you remember the penitentiary movie series? And I'm thinking, this is going to be good, you know? <laughs> He says, yeah, Cathedral Martin was in that movie. And the, the gentleman goes, wow, that's amazing. How did you know him? He goes, well, he's a friend of my cousin's sister or something. And you're thinking, you know, what's, what's about to happen next? And he goes, uh, well, have you made any other movies? And he goes, well, I uh, directed a uh, full-length feature film that starred Elliot Gould. Uh, it was titled uh, Dangerous Love. And I thought, hmm. Can only imagine. And so he says, What are you doing now? And he says, Well, I do a lot of short films. And I'm thinking, porn. <laughs> and, and, and he says, Well, what's the subject? And at this point, I'm. <laughs> and he says, uh, Kids. <laughs> and, and, and he goes, But that doesn't really pay the bills. So. In my spare time, I teach cinematography at uh, Calistoga County Community College in Northern California. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> and so, of course, you know, it's going to come, right? He says, so what do you do for a living? Well, uh, I'm between endeavors right now. And, uh, <laughs> I used to be a real estate magnate in Oakland, but uh, sort of the economic downturn did me some harm. And, well, uh, I still own a lot of places, but, uh, you know, money's kind of tight and all he says, I also am part owner of Pussycat Records. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> you know? And the guy goes, so you're an artist? He goes, no, I'm more of a guy who, uh, uh, well, uh, I spot and handle the talent, you know. <laughs> and I was, I, at that point, <laughs> I didn't want to hear anymore. So how was your day yesterday? <laughs> yes, it can only happen to me. And, of course, the flight from Los Angeles to Houston had four... Um, of our friends from south of the border who were drinking everything in sight and uh, they were having quite a party I'll tell you that was uh, that was an interesting trip but uh, I'm not talking about your people Marmina okay not, not that far south okay so at any rate it was a good trip um, any of you guys ever come from anybody from Berkeley area Oakland San Francisco no weather's beautiful Nice place to work, but I wouldn't want to live there, that sort of thing. Interesting. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the start of well test analysis. And you actually have a couple of uh, assignments on this. We talked about this a little bit the other day. If we look at a drawdown test with rate, I'm sure Ted's going to factor all this uh, initial discussion out, I hope. This is time. This is rate. This is the surface rate, which is constant. 
and then the sand face rate comes up like this. And basically what's going on is over here where Q sand face is approximately zero, the pressure is approximately PI. So PWF is approximately PI. And that makes sense, right? No flow, no change in pressure. And then there's a transition, which you can see, and that transition looks like this, and then that transition is here. What the authors of this particular uh, plot are trying to show is this is with wellbore storage and no skin, and then with wellbore storage and skin. Uh, the ideal response, of course, is a straight line. And then when we get down to the very end, this part, this is the straight line region here, and of course it would be extrapolated back to here. And this is a simulation, it's not a real data case, um, but this straight line, the slope, the MSL, is, uh, uh, sorry, it's proportional to, and I didn't write proportional correctly, sorry about that, proportional to one over the permeability. Now, also, there's going to be a problem with some of you that you have to realize that whenever you draw this line, it's fixed. It goes all the way across the page, and I strongly advise you to do that, okay? And I need to know the intercept of this line. The, the equation that we're looking at is PWF is equal to some constant A, plus some constant B times the log base 10 of T, right? So where's the intercept? Where's A? Marmina, you want to throw the ball to someone else? Where's Mr. Zanero? Mr. Zanero, what happens when I stick T equals one hour in here? What's the logarithm of one? Zero. So one hour is right here. We're looking for this point on the blue line. Not on the data, on the blue line. The blue line is our model. So we need to know the slope, and we need to know P one hour. There's two different cases on here. So we're showing that. One of the interesting things is that there is well bore storage and skin, but the slope of the line is the same. So the skin factor does not affect the, the, the line, okay? I mean, technically it will if storage and skin conspire to do something like this and just mess up the whole sequence. But once we're only looking at the skin effect, it displaces it. The skin displaces the line. It does not change the line. It displaces the line. So this would be P1 hour, no skin. And this is P1 hour with skin. Okay. And I didn't draw this very well. You'll be docked for this. But this, of course, is a straight line extrapolation. And once you draw the line, you forget about the data. It does not exist anymore. Imagine that you have a magic eraser, and you erase the data off of there, and you're only looking at estimating the slope and intercept. Dilhan, are they going to have a problem on this? Yes, and Dilhan's going, why did you give them the answer? Because I'm a nice guy. And if we reinforce this over and over again, maybe they'll learn something, right? Now, somebody tell me how to figure out if they are actually on the straight line. Is there a way to make this thing self-diagnose? <coughs> Three options. Yes, no, or maybe. Somebody take yes. Where's my cosmonaut friend? Take yes. Did you read about the International Space Station? Your rocket kind of jumped around and threw it out of orbit and that sort of thing? 
you know, we gave you $100 billion and it doesn't even stay still, that's okay. You can remind us our space shuttles keep burning up, but we won't, we won't talk too much about that. So let's take the yes position. How can we absolutely have this data self-diagnosed? Any ideas? If you don't give me an answer, I'm going to kill Mr. Cottle, okay? <laughs> Please, don't give me an answer. I want to know exactly that that straight line exists. Sorry? Say it again. Which derivative? The derivative of pressure with respect to what? Wrong. It's the derivative of pressure with respect to the logarithm of time. Okay? And what that gives us is the constant B. Okay? So we'll talk about that some more on the next slide. Is this perfect? Does this work every time? No. Why? Never does. Never does. <laughs> Thunk. Why not? You can't be right and not know why, Mr. Stone. That only works when you're a little boy, okay? Yes? Okay, that's actually a good point, that the condition is required for the logarithmic flow regime, we must have a constant flow rate, but let's take that out of the equation, okay? This is a simulation. Is there any error in the simulation? Somebody's head's going yes. No, there's not. Okay? Can we add error to the simulation? Yes. And what will happen when you take the derivative of something with error in it, Mr. Cottle? I'm rolling up the newspaper to whap you like the dog that you are. Ready? Thank you. Are you and Mr. Cottle interested in, you know, perhaps becoming a couple? <laughs> I think I've got four dollars here. <laughs> okay. Huh? Connell's engaged? What's his name? <laughs> <laughs> you hate me, don't you? Wait, don't you have a brother? No. No, I have a sister. It's kind of like having a brother, though, because she's crazy. <laughs> She lives on the coast of Louisiana, and she paints frogs. And I'm not talking about French people or the little green things. She paints pictures of frogs all day long. That's all she does. <laughs> yeah. You like that, huh? It's her specialty. What can I say? Okay, so you were suggesting that this variation, this random data error, will cause something to happen. And what will it cause to happen? Well, it caused the the derivative be kind of jumping up and down. So if we had perfect data, this idea would be pretty good. And in fact, if we had perfect data, what else could we do, Dilhan? We could take the second derivative, we could take the integral, we could take another function, and we could uniquely describe this whole thing. This is diagnostics. But here's where the twist comes in. That data error is going to drive you nuts. You know what else is going to drive you nuts? When we cut off the data before it gets to the straight line. Why would we do a thing like that, Mr. Cottle? And congratulations as well. I'm very happy for you. Send me an invitation. Tell me where you're registered. That sort of thing. I'll get you a Sonic gift card. <laughs> it's just a guess. <laughs> Okay, so if we cut the data off back here, what's going to happen? Are you going to see the, the derivative give a unique signature? We're talking about this in the abstract right now, but the answer is no. When I flip the slide to the next page and it shows the derivative, you'll understand what I mean. So let's flip the slide to the next page. So you guys, uh, Dr. Schechter showed up today, huh? That's good. Interesting. And he said it was your fault that he missed class, I heard, right? Yeah. Okay, so this here 
is what we call a log log plot. Mr. Beard, ready? Log of what? Delta P. Delta P equals PI minus PWF, right? That's these red things there, okay? See them? Okay. Now what else is plotted here? What else is plotted is the log of T times the derivative dPWF dt. Of course, you've got to take the absolute value. Why do we have to take the absolute value, Mr. Stone? Because things that go down have a negative slope. Okay? Ms. Levis, since you're back within my, uh, you know, range here, that there is a blue plus sign. Okay? And this is time in hours. Okay? Now, you don't know this yet, but this wellbore storage thing, delta P is equal to what? It's some constant. What's your favorite constant? One? No, symbol. Oh, you're Egyptian, right? So let's make some hieroglyphic things. Okay, so that's times time. <laughs> we can make it like King Tut. So there you go. Okay. You like? <laughs> Look, man, if you're going to burn my house down, <laughs> you know, wait till I've sold it, okay? <laughs> Here we go. All right. So how about A? Or, okay, so A times time. What's the power up here? What's B? I'll give you a hint. That's one and that's one. So B is equal to one. What does that mean, Mr. Stone? That means if I take a molecule out of the well bore, the pressure changes correspondingly. Exactly one to one. Not sort of one to one, not maybe one to one, but exactly one to one. Okay? Now let's take the derivative of this guy, d delta p, okay, and that's equal to a, right? Because b is equal to 1. So Mr. Cottle, what happens when we multiply by t? Right? So both the pressure drop and the derivative are both exactly unit slope. How can that be, Heather? It's the way God wanted it. Okay? Where's Mr. Goins? You get this? So there's a little mathematical trick here that the derivative of a function times, to, or a constant times time is the constant. And then we multiply it by time again because that's our base function. So we get the same thing. So guess what, boys and girls? The line over here is what? That's well bore storage, but it has a special name. Mr. Stone, you'll appreciate this name. It's well bore storage domination. Okay? All right, so now we go back to our rate plot. Surface rate's constant. Sand face rate goes up. Where are we at on the rate plot? We're right here. QSF is approximately equal to zero. That's well bore storage domination. Okay? So, Marmina, in a way, what that tells us is the properties of the well bore. That particular place where the rate out of the reservoir is zero, the rate's only out of the well bore, we get information about the reservoir, or about the well bore, right? 
Now the right question is, who cares? Because having knowledge about the wellbore is irrelevant, but knowing where wellbore storage is, is relevant. Okay, now Dilhan hates this part. Now we're looking at the data through this region. And we know that over here, delta P is equal to some constant, and I gotta change the constant, alpha plus beta times the logarithm of t, let's say, okay? And then it's derivative. What's the derivative of this, Marmina? D delta P dt? Marmina's mad at me. Zanero, what's the derivative of a constant? Zero. What's the derivative of beta log t? Beta over t, right? Then when I multiply it by t, what happens? That gives me beta, right? Where's beta on this graph? That's beta, okay? So, we know two regions uniquely. We know the wellbore storage domination region, and we know the so-called radial flow region. Here, the flow is only coming from the wellbore. There's QSF is equal to zero, and Q surface is equal to a constant, okay? But it's equal to zero. Q, S, F is equal to zero for wellbore storage distortion, or uh, domination, sorry. And of course, out here, Q surface is equal to Q, S, F. What's the outer boundary condition of the reservoir for the logarithmic regime. And of course, we haven't talked about this yet, so you don't know. Anybody? Somebody volunteer. Lucas, what's the outer boundary? It's infinite acting. Okay? So R of T, there's no boundary. It does not know there's a boundary there. So that's what's represented by the logarithm. All right, this is a good game, right? You like it? So what can you determine inside of here? Let's make this easy. This is the well bore. This is a reservoir. What's here? It's a transition, that's correct. But it's a combination of the wellbore and the reservoir. So what can we determine? Nothing. Right? And how long does that last? According to this particular case, it's about 10 hours. Dilhan, is this typical? No. It could last hundreds or even thousands of hours before you see this regime that you can analyze the reservoir behavior. Mr. Zanero, what would you like to see next? Your little picture. That's really cute, thank you. I'm glad you guys got enough time on your hands. I, frankly, I think it's the other way around, but whatever you say. Okay, now this is the same thing as the previous plot, only now we're looking at a buildup. Why is this pointing to the left? And why are we plotting TP plus delta T? None of this really makes any sense, right? So let's draw it out slowly. Okay. So this is time, right? This is rate, the surface rate during the drawdown. 
Q surface is equal to a number. What is it during a buildup? It's zero. Okay? The pressure during a drawdown drops down. And then what happens? It builds back up. All right? Now there's a magic point called TP. Okay? And TP is the production time. Sorry. This is the pressure in the well, PW. Now these guys have flipped this around. The reason we use this diagram is because it's in your book. This is a Schlumberger text. Okay? Is everybody okay with this? Now what happens is you, you take this variable rate sequence. Now let me ask you a simple question. Is this a mirror image? It's a very simple question. Is the buildup a mirror image of the drawdown? No, it's not. Because what happens is the drawdown still pretends like it's occurring and you're referencing a point here. So you're going to be off by this bit. You have to do what's called superposition. And when you perform superposition, which we'll explain to you later, you create a plotting function, and that plotting function is TP plus delta T. What's another name for TP plus delta T? Well, it's the total time, because delta T starts here. Delta T is time minus TP, okay? So that's the total time, and then this is the buildup time, delta T. Okay. Why is this thing plotted backwards? Why does it go in reverse direction? No, I'm saying that it should be, if we plotted it versus time, the logarithm of time, pressure, what would it do? It'd do like that. But this one goes backwards. Why? Sorry? Well, it's this plotting function. That's what it is. So what's the logical thing to do? Tell Excel to switch the min and the max and reverse the order and make it go to the right. So all of the plots that we give you in this class, it'll be plotted to the right. You just have to remember that. Okay. And they went on to show that this is the build-up time at one hour, and they're referencing a point on the line, not on the data. We're going to go through this in excruciating detail later on. But once you construct the line, forget about the data. The line is king. The data is just there to hang around. Okay, we've got about 20 minutes. Well, you still can determine it by flipping it the other way. All you're doing is reversing the axis. You're going to plot from whatever to a zero. It just flips it. And what you're going to do is the extrapolation, and that's a good point, I'm sorry I didn't mention that, the extrapolation to zero is not the initial pressure. It's the false pressure. That's why it's called P star. For a new reservoir with no depletion, P star is PI. But for everything else, P star is a false pressure. And they've drawn this to where you would believe that every case is going to look like that. But what's actually going to happen is because you're going to have depletion, it will flatten out, and this will be P bar. Okay. Dilhan, have I forgotten anything? I'm sorry, Master, have I forgotten anything? <laughs> okay. Everybody sort of got the hang of this? Now, Dr. McVeigh, when you take these petty 400 and 401, he's going to make you use a simulator and generate a build-up test and prove that you can estimate the permeability. 
Don't make me look bad. This is real easy to do. Just take the pressure time data, make the plot as we described. We're going to do it a dozen times, maybe two dozen times. Don't forget how to do this. The reason that you correct the buildup plot is because it's not the same as the drawdown. What happens if you have a very large producing time, if TP is a very large number? Louder, sorry. I can't hear you. What happens if TP is a very large number? Sorry? No, no, no. Okay, let's play a game, all right? So we have TP plus delta T over delta T, all right? So TP over delta T plus 1. Well, that doesn't look very interesting, does it? So let's flip it upside down. Dilhan, am I about to make an idiot out of myself? Probably so. Okay, so let's look at delta T over TP plus delta T. And let's divide through. And that gives us, uh, how do I want to do this? Mm -hmm. So we'll multiply through by 1 over TP, delta T, 1 over TP. TP plus delta T. What's that going to do? That's going to give me... No, I want to divide through. Let me think. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I hate when I do things on the fly because I never remember what my point was. I know that scares you, right? What am I trying to prove? If TP is large, then we can ignore it. That's what I'm trying to prove. I can do it with uh, effective time. I'm not sure I can do it here. Uh, let's see. P1 plus 3. Ah, let's not worry about it. We'll come back to it when we talk about buildups. Sorry? What happens whenever TP is large? And, and there's another formulation of this problem that TP going to infinity eliminates itself. Okay? Not for this function, but for the other one. And so by extension, when it eliminates itself for the other one, we can use, we can ignore TP. For example, if you have an old well out in West Texas that's been producing for five years and you shut it in for 10 hours, does the producing time matter? Of course not. But you know that because it's logical. But the other issue is how you would formulate this problem. And I think the reason I'm not getting the answer I want here is because it's not going to be transient flow. It'll be pseudo steady state. But if we go back and we look at TP plus delta T over TP times delta T, then the math works out to where that term goes to, uh, uh, it eliminates itself. Actually, I got it upside down. It'd be TP times delta T over TP plus delta T. And what you see is if uh, you divide through, then you get... Uh, 1 over 1 plus delta T over TP times delta T. And if TP goes to infinity, then uh, this function TP times delta T over TP plus delta T, and that's a time, sorry, uh, goes to delta T. See how that goes? And so that's your proof. This is actually the formal superposition time. The same applies to Horner time, which is the one we're talking about right now. But what I was trying to do was explain that TP does not have an effect on this if it's very large. If it's 10 times larger than T, or it's uh, 100, or sorry, delta T, or it's 100 times larger than delta T, it's not going to matter.
No, but you're talking about only if I, if I produce the well like this. And then I shut it in for a very small period of time. That's delta T. Think about it in that context. It's just a little sliver of time. It's one one hundredth of the production. So if the production is much larger than the shut-in, it's not going to matter. Okay. Good question. All right, you can't read this, and I apologize. Uh, what they're trying to do is explain wellbore storage. They're trying to explain linear flow. And then they're trying to explain uh, radial flow. And this is really complicated because it was written by people who think they know what they're doing to explain to people who think they know what they're doing. But suffice it to say that you have multiple plots. The plot that we're interested in right now is a logarithm of time plot which is the so-called semi-log plot here. There's also a square root of time plot that's for formation linear flow, and there's also a Cartesian plot, and that's for wellbore storage. So what this is telling you is that for each of these flow regimes, that is wellbore storage, then you would uh, have a certain behavior on a Cartesian plot. For linear flow, which is for a fractured well, you'll have a certain behavior. There's also a regime called bilinear flow, and bilinear flow has another regime that's also for a fractured well. And then for the semi-log plot, looking at the derivative, you would have a, a certain characteristic, the derivative or the pressure drop. But we're going to cover all of this in excruciating detail, so don't worry about it right now. What I really wanted to emphasize to you is that for infinite acting radial flow, you're going to use that to estimate permeability. But if permeability is less than about one one hundredth of a millidarcy, forget it. You're never going to see radial flow, so this plot doesn't apply. And you need to think about that. If the plot does not apply, stop. There's no penalty. If we ask you to analyze a flow regime that does not exist, and we might do that, stop. It has to be validated. It has to exist in order for you to analyze it. And what I, Tom, do not like is the square root of time plot and the fourth root of time plot because when you start taking the square root and the fourth root of something and plotting it on a Cartesian graph, it looks like a straight line and it's not. The much better diagnostic is the log-log plot and we're going to spend the majority of the semester talking about, excuse me, log-log analysis and how to diagnose that. And we'll show you how to use the derivative to capture those linear and bilinear flow regimes if in fact they exist, also to capture wellbore storage. Okay, what's our time? We got uh, about 10 minutes, okay. The reason that I made the boxes dotted here is because chances are you'll see maybe one or two drawdown tests in your career. Unless you work in West Texas, you might see a few pressure falloff tests in your career you're going to see almost exclusively pressure buildup tests in your career. Drawdown test can't be analyzed because you can't hold the rate constant. Pressure falloff tests are generally going to be injection wells in developed fields. Some people live or die by them. Others don't. And then, of course, we're left with a traditional buildup test. Okay? So the dotted box just tells you you may or may not see this. Pressure buildup test, you can determine the reservoir behavior, you can determine the formation permeability, skin factor, fracture half length, reservoir pressure, and boundaries. I'm going to make a mark by reservoir pressure and explain to you that that is unlikely. You know, there'd be a question mark there because the test has to be very long to estimate the reservoir pressure and to estimate reservoir boundaries. Yeah, I think I'm going to stop now and let you guys have your quiz. The rest of this, you're on your own. Bill, on you ready? Okay.
Okay, this is exercise number four. This will be due on Friday. You'll notice that you have a Cartesian plot, you have a semi-log plot, you have a log, log or sorry, a, a semi-log y, this is semi-log x, and then a log-log plot. You are expected to be able to establish a straight line. Obviously, we have not corrupted these data, so you should be able to estimate the equation of the straight line based on this. You must have a perfect answer for credit. If you forget that you are using the log base 10, that is what we plot, log base 10, and you use something else, sorry. Dylan, any comments on your part? 